Hello guys. Uh, today our speaker is Professor Aranam Sen from uh, School of Physical Science, Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science, Kolkata. This is the hopefully uh, I'm again forgetting probably. This is the 95th or 96th talk in the series, uh, and uh, the topic of. Uh, talk of today's uh, discussion is quantum scars and Hilbert space fragmentation in many body systems. Uh, thank you, Arna, for uh, accepting uh, the invitation to give the talk in this for this forum. And I believe that will be helpful for all of us. Uh, you can start. Yeah. OK, so thanks, Shantan. Thanks for the kind invitation. Uh, to give a seminar in this uh, QASTM seminar series. It's actually pretty nice that uh, this is sort of the 95th or the 96th seminar, as you just said. So it's pretty amazing that uh, so many seminars have already been organized through this uh, uh, forum. Okay, so as Shantan said, the topic for today is uh, quantum scars and Hilbert space uh, fragmentation in many body systems. And uh, since uh, this is a talk meant uh, for students, uh, hopefully there'll be some questions as we go on. And uh, I'll be very happy to stop in between and uh, take them if there's any question or confusion. Okay, so let's go on. So, uh, okay, yeah. So here is the outline of the talk. So this talk is going to be about the many body quantum systems, which are uh, undergoing a unitary dynamics. So that means that uh, the system is basically not connected to a heat bath, whatever, there are many, many degrees of freedom and they're just interacting among themselves and they're described by some Hamiltonian edge and the Hamiltonian edge is providing for a quantum evolution, okay? But but that Hamiltonian edge can be sufficiently complex. Okay, it's a many body system and it's a gen genuine interacting system. So here, uh, the main focus on the talk would be something which has been recently discovered, which is called this phenomenon of uh, uh, weak ergodicity violation. So what do I mean by that? And that's going to be the main uh, sort of uh, hero of this rest of the talk. So. Basically, what it means is, so when we talk about thermalization in any system, the way we think of it in statistical mechanics, we usually start the system in some arbitrary initial state, and maybe that initial state is strongly out of equilibrium, and then we let the system evolve. And then, because the system is sufficiently complicated, uh, that initial state uh, does something complicated due to the dynamics introduced by the interactions in the system, and then finally approaches some kind of an equilibrium state. And even if you start with uh, many different initial states, uh, they basically relax to the same final equilibrium state. And that's what we understand by thermalization. So the insensitivity to initial conditions. And uh, yeah. Uh, however, here we'll see that there are certain kinds of very interesting many body systems. And now there are some very interesting experimental examples known as well. Uh, where even though most of the initial states uh, sort of thermalize, uh, there are uh, sort of very few initial states. There are some, some class of initial states which completely fail to thermalize, even though this is a highly interactive system. Okay? And uh, that's what's called weak ergodicity uh, breaking. Okay? So I'll introduce this experimental thing which really kick-started this field, uh, this uh, notion of weak ergodicity breaking in uh, experiments in Rydberg chains. So there was a rather interesting experiment in 2017 in uh, uh, Lucan's lab at Harvard. And uh, that basically generated a lot of interest in this field and sort of led to a revival uh, of this field in the past uh, uh, three years or so, okay? And uh, I'll essentially concentrate on uh, two spin models. Uh, and I'll uh, introduce uh, uh, what's actually happening in those spin models. Okay, And these are now, this, this particularly this first spin model, there's a very well-known spin model now in the community. It's called the PXP model. 
and I'll introduce what that is and uh, what is the special thing about scarring here. And then uh, I'll also introduce a second model, which is again very well known in condensed matter physics. Uh, it comes by different names. So here I've just used the name of U1 quantum link model, but it's a rather well known model in condensed matter physics. And people were interested in studying the various phases of this model at uh, near, the, near its ground state. But it turns out that there are very interesting properties of this model if one looks at the entire spectrum, including these uh, many body stars, right? And then if time permits, which probably it won't, uh, I'll also introduce what is known as uh, Hilbert space fragmentation. So that's basically the uh, 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 outline of the talk. Yeah. Right. So, Prunab, I have a question, if you don't mind. Yes. Uh, probably we'll discuss, but I'm just asking. Uh, it's regarding this thermalization thing that you have uh, probably will discuss. Yes, yes. Uh, you said that you will start with an arbitrary initial state and you will allow to the system will evolve. But when the system evolves, it goes to uh, out of equilibrium. Mm -hmm. it's, it's expected that it is, suppose it goes to some out of equilibrium. Now, depending on different, different systems, Mm -hmm. uh, we know that the thermalization, uh, reaching the thermalization is not exactly uh, same. Mm -hmm. uh, means maybe the thermalization time scale or maybe the equilibration time scale that will not be the same. Mm -hmm. And there might be some other uh, uh, things you might introduce which will trigger the thermalization process. Mm -hmm. uh, so like when say not. Okay, so I'm just asking that uh, like without knowing anything regarding the system, how one can actually gain the idea of this kind of approach? Uh, so maybe this slide makes it clearer. So what I actually mean is the following. So, uh, so as I said, I start with an isolated many body quantum system. Okay. So let me introduce this slide. And if your question remains, then please ask me again. Okay. Okay. So, so, so I introduced some isolated many body quantum system. It has many, many, many degrees of freedom. For concreteness, you can imagine some quantum spin system on a lattice, okay, interacting quantum spin system on a lattice. And then I initialize my system in some pure wave function. This is your psi zero, okay. And then because there is a Hamiltonian in the problem, so more specifically, imagine that you're just quenching the uh, problem. Okay, so you just prepare the system in an initial state and you just quench it with some interacting Hamilton. Okay, so of course, you know what this U of T here is, it's just exponential minus IHT in that case. Then you just evolve the system. And of course, at each time there is a pure many body wave function. And it's pure because it's a purely unitary evolution. I'm not, uh, I'm ignoring all kinds of interactions to the key part, okay, to any external. Uh, thing here, okay? So, so, so then the, the point is the following. Of course, the, the wave function at any time t remains pure, right? Just because of the structure here of this problem. However, if I look at some local observation, local in space observation, so I'll be a bit more careful in defining them as I go on. So if I look at a local in space observable, uh, and then calculate its expectation value at time t, that expectation value reaches a, a thermal description, okay? And what provides the thermal description? The thermal description, so you need a temperature to provide you with thermal description. That thermal description or the temperature for that thermal description is simply provided by the energy density of this initial state. Okay, so what I'm saying is that if you start with any generic complicated quantum many body system, actually, if you start with an out of equilibrium state, the system would definitely thermalize to a equilibrium state if you wait long enough. Of course, what you mean by long enough depends on what particular system you're considering. And that's a harder question. Let's not get into that immediately. But the statement is that you'll eventually thermalize. And Systems which do not eventually uh, thermalize are actually the most surprising elements. Okay, so was that a sort of an answer to your question? Yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, like, yeah. 
since you have mentioned regarding the quench, so it, 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 like this quench procedure actually triggers the procedure, or like what we can say? Like, uh, so, 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 so you see, if I start with an arbitrary initial state, right? Some simple initial state. Suppose you are an experimentalist. Let's say, let's okay. say we wear our experimentalist hat and we want to prepare a sort of a state in the lab, right? Then, of course, as you know, it's very hard to make a pure eigenstate of an interacting quantum system in any finite time. Ooh. Okay, Ooh. so typically, what we'll make is some simple unentangled state. So maybe you consider a spin half system on a lattice for completeness. So, uh, so let's say at each side you go and you just uh, initialize that spin in some direction on its internal block sphere, right? So there is a spin living here, there's a spin living here, spin living here. Or maybe you start with a fully polarized state here, right? That's a very simple unentangled state. Now, typically that state would not be an eigenstate of your quench Hamilton because that's an interacting theory, right? So of course there'll be a non-trivial evolution. Right, because uh, the state that you are you have here is not an energy eigenstate of your Hamiltonian, your many-body Hamiltonian, and therefore, obviously, you know, if you look at any local observable, there'll be some non-trivial dynamics due to the unitary evolution just by Schrodinger's equation. So, yeah, yeah, like connecting to this, I'm asking too many questions. Sorry for that. Mm -hmm. No, that's okay. So yeah, the connecting to this thing, I'm just like. So since you have mentioned this, it's isolated, the uh, dynamics is unitary. So can uh, this kind of procedure or means formalism can be generalized for uh, the system which is interacting with the thermal bar, like open quantum systems and yeah, all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In principle, there are generalizations. So there are many ways to generalize this. That's a harder question, of course. Uh, so one way of generalizing this is called the Lindblad approach. Yeah. So. Basically, what you have is then a sort of a small non-unitary component to your dynamics, right? And the non-unitary component, of course, depends on your interaction with the heat bar, right? But there's another way you can view this problem, actually. And that's an interesting way, which is that suppose you look at a patch of the system here. I hope you can see my cursor, right? Yeah. So, uh, so if you consider a patch of the system here, so suppose your system is very big, it's a rather big a complicated quantum system and you look at any patch of this then if you integrate out the rest of the degrees of freedom of the system then actually the equation of motion of this patch is actually non unitary right so that's another way of thinking yes right so yeah. but there also you can apply this quench in this Lindbladian operator no of course uh, there uh, what you need to do is uh, you need to derive from first principles what's the non unitary dynamics Okay. that non-unitary dynamics may be very complicated and then making some assumptions you may read some kind of a Lindblad in uh, oh, okay. right i mean see this full problem is very complicated right so yeah. i'm posing the problem in one manner right because yeah. that allows you to focus directly on the eigenstates of some many body hamiltonian right but okay. there are multiple ways you can pose this problem because this is a very general problem right so yeah yeah um, so, yeah this is very very uh, well studied problem these days in different different directions of course of course yes like people from gravity side of course uh, the quantum field theory side people are uh, studying this problem in different different models so yes of course it's a really a very important uh, question and problem you are actually discussing mm -hmm. so, yeah i'm very much interested you okay. yeah uh, okay so so now this question uh, this question that I exactly posed here, and as I said, of course, uh, clearly the full system cannot thermalize. That's impossible because you know this wave function is always pure if you start with a pure wave function. So what actually happens is that only local operators thermalize, and I'll of course be a bit more concrete as I go on. Uh, so 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 the point is that questions like this, uh, people, even people like von Neumann in the 1930s were worrying about such kinds of questions, right? So questions like this have a very long history. Uh, what has happened more recently in the past uh, decade or so is that uh, now there are beautiful experimental platforms, uh, sort of synthetic quantum systems like uh, ultra cold atoms or trapped ions or 
superconducting qubits, etc. Where this assumption that I have made that basically you can very well isolate a system from the rest of its environment for a rather long time scale and then actually see this pristine unitary dynamics. That assumption holds true for a reasonably long time compared to the microscopic scales of the uh, interacting Hamiltonian uh, in these kinds of experimental platforms. And therefore, now people can actually even test many of the things experimentally and even see very interesting things. So, uh, because of the tremendous experimental progress in the past decade or so, there has been a huge revival of interest in uh, the theoretical aspects of this thing. And as Shantan already said, I mean, there are uh, sort of uh, multiple sort of regions in theoretical physics where similar sort of ideas, uh, uh, you know, help us understand things, okay? So, yeah, okay, good. So now here is a slightly more elaborate uh, description of what I just said. So of course, uh, uh, there, this is your full system. And as I said, there is this S and there is this S bar and the full system is isolated. So this S is just some uh, patch in the system, which I can consider, right? Where my, some local operator is living, right? And then of course, if you want to look at this local operator, what you, there are two ways of looking at it. Either you can look at the full density matrix of the system, or you can just integrate out degrees of freedom in this bar and just uh, look at uh, the reduced density matrix in the system. Okay? So there are, uh, these are both uh, exactly equivalent ways of looking at any local operator which can be sort of localized in this region. Okay. So then what happens is uh, the usual notion of thermalization. If you start with a generic many body quantum system, then uh, suppose uh, you start with uh, initial condition one, which is indicated by blue, which is let's say one pure wave function and initial condition two, which is indicated by this red and which is some other initial uh, uh, condition. And let's say both these initial conditions, both these pure wave functions satisfy the property that with respect to the Hamiltonian with which you're quenching the problem, they have the same energy density or similar energy densities. okay? Then if you let the system evolve as a function of time and you just look at some local observable uh, here, okay? So you just look at this quantity as a function of time then what happens is uh, that uh, what happens is that uh, as time progresses, uh, uh, you see that uh, uh, both this initial condition and that initial condition, even though they were very different to start with, with respect to the local properties, they basically go to the same answer. So, and I have integrated this answer by O thermal. Okay, just to integrate that this is actually the same answer that you would have gotten by a completely different calculation, by a completely different calculation, if you had assumed that the full system is connected to a heat bath and the temperature of the system is basically such that, uh, you know, in the thermal calculation, you get the same energy density as the energy density of your initial state. So this is a rather remarkable correspondence because this is a purely unitary dynamics, what this, schematic figure is trying to indicate. And this, this O thermal is a completely separate calculation where you are basically just uh, uh, taking the system in a mixed density matrix. Uh, and uh, let's say it's a canonical density matrix where the temperature is provided such that the initial density, uh, initial, uh, uh, such that the den uh, energy density of the initial condition is the same as the uh, energy density in the thermal. So uh, can anybody think of this O thermal to be satisfying some kind of generalized Gibbs ensemble? Type no, of? so for a generic system, you won't have a generalized Gibbs ensemble, but if you have something called as integrable systems, which have much more structure than uh, uh, generic quantum systems. Okay. So integrable systems generally have an extensive number of locally conserved quantities. And there you have a notion of a generalized Gibbs ensemble, uh, simply because there are an extensive number of conservation laws. So exactly yeah. as in statistical mechanics, uh, if you have multiple conservation laws, you have multiple Lagrange multipliers describing the sort of the density matrix, if you wish. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, almost the same story there for an uh, integrable quantum system, right? But for a generic quantum system, uh, it'll just go to the thermal ensemble. 
the answer. Even though I would again like to stress, of course, the wave function stays a pure wave function, right? So, yeah. so, 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 so the idea is that even though the system is pure, but nonetheless, the system acts as a bath for itself. Okay, so if you look at some subsystem here, says that the number of degrees of freedom outside is much more than the number of degrees of freedom here, then basically the rest of the system is acting as a box for the system. Okay, so that's the general idea. Okay, and uh, portrayed this way or conveyed this way, this does not sound like such an unnatural thing. Because uh, after all, uh, it's almost like saying I have a micro canonical ensemble in my usual statistical mechanics, quantum statistical mechanics. And now I have defined my micro canonical ensemble in such a manner that the micro canonical ensemble literally encloses just one state in the system, right? Or something like that. So what do I mean by that? So what I mean by that is, so as I actually said in response to one of uh, Shantan's questions, this psi zero can be anything here, okay? So in particular, let's say the psi zero is one of the eigenstates of my many body. So if psi zero is one of the eigenstates of my many body Hamiltonian, then it's very straightforward to see that if I consider a local operator, because I'm just evolving my wave function in a purely unitary fashion. And if my uh, psi zero is a many body wave function, then the time evolution will just make it pick up a phase, right? Nothing more. So the phase picked up here and the phase picked up here would just cancel each other out. And then for a local observable, you will just see something constant in time. Okay, something like that, right? So that motivates us to sort of something which is called the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So what is the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis? So basically that tells you that, uh, sorry, I'm, yeah. So basically that tells you that if you look at the spectrum of your theory for a many body uh, system, and if you consider any high energy eigenstate, in that spectrum, then if you consider that eigenstate and just look at its local properties, that eigenstate with respect to its local properties itself looks thermal. Okay, so that's uh, one of the ways of uh, stating the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Okay? And uh, hopefully this figure sort of tells you what I mean here, because, uh, so I'm just restressing this point. If I start with the many body eigenstate here, then basically this answer does not change. And uh, then just by, uh, just based on self-consistency, this answer should also go to O thermal. Okay, so yeah. I just yeah. have one more comment or maybe. Mm -hmm. So like, since you are talking about a general system, so I'm just mm -hmm. uh, pointing one more things up. I think this phase will cancel provided there is no hollow norm or gauge field. Uh, like so okay i'm not an expert on those things so i cannot give you a short answer or a well educated answer uh, there otherwise it will pick up a phase it okay will... but any okay but uh, let's say for problems like this where you have interacting quantum spin systems uh, what i'm saying is uh, true in general i mean maybe i'm considering uh, uh, so yeah, for concreteness, because I'm considering these uh, lattice models uh, uh, with, uh, yeah, because I'm considering these lattice models and these are non-relativistic. Uh, so here, whatever I'm saying, this is uh, basically true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, there may be some problems if you take continuum limits in an uncontrolled manner. I just have pointed because they, there is a problem we uh, sometimes deal with, which mm -hmm. is John Simon's matter theories. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, which is okay. like a kind of an anionic theory. Yeah, okay. So there, if you do this kind of calculation, then immediately, mm -hmm. uh, even if the evolution is unitary, it will pick up a phase kind of e to the power something minus something times t. Okay, and this mm -hmm. something minus something is not exactly same, so it will not cancel. Yeah, so that's correct. Some time dependence uh, is there in the phase factor. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, but even there, typically one is concerned uh, more about ground state or very low energy properties. 
it's not completely obvious that if you take a lattice model there, which sort of realizes these things uh, in continuum in the low energy sort of uh, in a low energy description, it's not obvious whether you, if you start with the lattice model there, the full lattice model, it's not obvious what happens if you start from a high energy state there. Sure. Right? Because, uh, yeah, that's not an obvious thing. So, hmm. uh, yeah, because uh, this thing is very general. I mean, there must be very special things happening in a system uh, to sort of evade this thermalization. Yeah, I mean, that's all I want to say. Yeah. So, we'll consider one aspect of what might be those special things. So, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so as I was saying that uh, basically one way of understanding uh, the post-quench dynamics is to take your initial state and just uh, break it up uh, in the basis of, uh, let's, say, let's say I call the Hamiltonian H all the time now. So that Hamiltonian has an energy basis, obviously, right? So if you take the energy basis, uh, then in that energy basis, of course, you can expand your initial uh, wave function, right? So maybe there's a psi of zero and I, on the right-hand side, I can write it as summation of I uh, CI times EI, where EI is, let's say, uh, your energy eigenfunction. And then of course, in principle, we know what this operator does. That's very simple. At least you write a formal expression. Of course, it's not simple to calculate it because it's a very hard problem to calculate uh, energy eigenstates of an interacting theory. But at least we can write this expression on the right hand side very easily just by uh, doing this resolution in terms of the energy eigenstates of the theory. Okay. So basically, there are two parts to this uh, thing. Uh, there is one piece here uh, which does not depend on time in any explicit manner. And there is uh, another piece here, which has all kinds of uh, temporal factors. Okay. So basically what ETH says is, uh, so ETH makes statements about both these uh, sort of uh, diagonal elements, if you wish, in the energy basis, as well as these off diagonal elements in the energy basis. Okay. So these off diagonal elements uh, basically have a lot of information about how the system eventually relaxes under a unitary dynamics to a uh, seemingly thermal ensemble. Okay, so it has a lot of information about that, but it's also more complicated and less understood. Let me not focus on this immediately here for this talk. Uh, let's just focus on this diagonal ensemble. Uh, sorry, on on these diagonal matrix elements. Okay, in red. So, uh, so basically, if you start with uh, any reasonable initial state, if you start with any reasonable initial state, and if you sort of uh, plot uh, the sort of, uh, uh, if, you, if you plot, let's say the probability density of these uh, CI, uh, mod CI squares, okay? Then uh, just from very general arguments for short range Hamiltonians, short range Hamiltonians in space, you can show that these, uh, these numbers are rather are very strongly peaked near a certain uh, energy density. Okay, in fact, if the system is large enough, and if you just look at the energy density profile uh, of these numbers, uh, these things just approach a delta function in uh, in energy density. Okay, so 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 now suppose I'm making the statement which is the statement of ETH, that if you look at any of these diagonal elements, and these diagonal elements are basically the same if you look at neighboring energy eigenvectors, and they basically attain the thermal value. And then if I'm saying that these things, these CI squares are only substantially non-zero if you are near the energy density that you are considering, then of course you can basically take these guys out, these matrix elements out of the sum because they're basically constant. And then you're just left with summation of I mod CI squared, which is one by definition. And because I've already said that uh, the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis says that this quantity is basically thermal. If you're considering a local in space operator, then you're done. That's one way of stating how the answer eventually goes to a thermal answer if you are considering a dynamics like that, okay? So that's that. So this is one way of uh, justifying that a generic quantum system uh, always does something like this. 
Okay, this is one way of justifying. Okay. Uh, by the way, I should like to point out that there is no strict proof of this eigenstate thermalization hypothesis for uh, reasonable short-range uh, lattice models. Okay, there's no strict proof given for this. Uh, basically, there are very strong and convincing arguments for uh, for the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis to be true in the semi-classical limit. But for uh, fully quantum problems uh, far from the semi-classical limit, there's no sort of proof known for this thing. But uh, there are many numerical calculations uh, and there are some other sort of uh, arguments which tell you that uh, this thing should basically be true. Yeah, so let's just uh, take it on that. Right, and uh, most likely it's true for uh, generic systems. Okay, but uh, yeah, I would just like to point out that there's no strict proof for this. So, uh, so, so now there is no heat bath here, right? And uh, so, let me actually try to discuss this picture because uh, this is sort of important. I said that there is no heat bath here, but uh, then you can very well ask the question, how is the system at all thermalizing, right? I mean, what's the picture of thermalization, at least for local people? So the picture is given here. So let's say I start with some simple initial condition and the simple initial condition is basically unentangled. And that's what this picture is supposed to convey. I mean, basically, this is like a spin half degree of freedom living at each side. And these sort of baby lines indicate that maybe this side is entangled to this side and that side is entangled to that side, right? So this initial state is, has a very low entanglement, right? And then as you propagate the state in time with some unitary evolution, as I've indicated here, then what actually happens is, of course, there's a closed uh, quantum system, right? So basically the amount of quantum information that you have is preserved, right? Uh, which is another way of saying that your density matrix remains pure, the full density matrix remains pure. But uh, this entanglement gets more and more complicated if you look at your uh, uh, many body wave function. And this is what I've tried to schematically indicate here. Now, because this entanglement becomes more and more in, uh, complicated, then if you look at a local correlation function, so maybe you're measuring some expectation value of this pin at this side. If you look at a local correlation function, then Basically, because uh, the quantum information is spreading in such a complicated manner through the entire system, unless you look at some highly non-local, uh, highly non-local correlation functions at large time, uh, you cannot make out that the system is in a pure state. And if you just like, look at local correlation functions, you would almost think that uh, the memory of your initial state is erased, but it's actually not erased. It's just distributed through your entire system in. Uh, more and more complicated uh, entanglement structures. It's just that local probes or local correlation functions or local operators find it very hard to pick up this information. You need extremely non-local uh, uh, observables or correlation functions to pick up this information. Okay? So that's the picture of thermalization under uh, strictly unitary evolution. Okay? So basically, uh, the rest of the system, the rest of the system just provides an entanglement bath for this patch of the system. For, it, for the degrees of freedom here, you sort of keep getting entangled to the degrees of freedom living outside this patch. Okay, and that's the picture. Okay. So this is sort of the rough or physical way in which you want to, you may want to think of uh, uh, thermalization under purely unitary dynamics. And this also sort of tells you why local observables are different from non-local. By the way, I could have written several non-local observables like projectors on eigenfunctions or other non-local observables here, which would have never thermalized uh, under this uh, 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 unitary evolution. They would always have been oscillatory functions of time. It's, it's uh, straightforward to write uh, many uh, sort of, uh, um, I mean, many Hermitian operators like that. Okay, it's straightforward to write them. It's just that when you then write those Hermitian operators in real space, in real space, they are highly non-local objects in real space. So I hope this part of the thing is clear. I mean, yeah, then I can perhaps go. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, like, uh, as you have said that once you evolve this for uh, uh, at some 
some time later, the entanglement dynamics is very complicated for many body wave function. Mm -hmm. so I can understand for the system you were describing, but for in general many body systems, writing down, down, a very, down a very complicated wave function is possible because like there are many techniques available these days like tensor networks. No, no, but Shantan, I would like to interrupt here. So yeah. there is a very important point here. So you see, your dynamics progressively keeps increasing the entanglement of your pure state, okay? In fact, on general grounds, what you can show is that uh, even though you start from an area law state, okay, something which does not have a, a lot of entanglement. Uh, so even if you start with something satisfying the area law in entanglement entropy, after some reasonable time scale, you quickly go to volume law entangled states. Okay, and those are not at all easy to describe using tensor networks or matrix product states. Tensor networks or matrix product states are very good if you want to describe the corner of your Hilbert space, which are basically encapsulated by area law states. Uh, these techniques are not at all good if you want to describe uh, volume law states. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So then let me go on. Now comes the sort of question which I want to highlight for the rest of my uh, discussion. So the question is the following. Um, uh, are there systems known which uh, violate ETH? So that's the question. So what do I mean by that? So again, I take an interacting theory exactly like this. But now, in spite of the theory being interacting, the rest of the system fails to be a bath for uh, any finite subsystem, okay? Now, this is a highly unusual uh, situation, okay? So, and now let's try to understand this in more detail. Another way of posing it is, if you look at these initial conditions and their time evolution, the only sort of local memory uh, left after a reasonable amount of time propagation here, the only local memory that is left is the energy density in the wave function. Okay, all the other local memories are sort of washed away. That's why you reach uh, thermal and so on, okay. locally. Uh, however, for the systems that I'm going to talk about, uh, there are sort of uh, some other local uh, memory left behind, even though you are uh, sort of propagating the system under uh, many body interacting. Okay, so that is what uh, is going to be the focus of the rest of the talk. So of course, uh, there are some well-known uh, violations to the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. One of the well-known violations is the integrable, our integrable quantum many body systems. And here, uh, the violation is because uh, all the eigenstates, not only the low energy ones, in, in fact, the high energy ones as well, all the eigenstates have a quasi-particle distribution. So when we usually do condensed matter, uh, I mean, uh, we know that ground states or neighboring states, uh, typically we can write a quasi-particle description for it. But you can easily ask, does this description go all through? And the answer is no. Because if you go to higher and higher energy states, then the sort of number of quasi-particles in your states keeps increasing. Now, if you consider a low energy state, then the number of quasi-particles is very small. So you can basically ignore the interactions between the quasi-particles and you can sort of think of this as a free theory in terms of the quasi-particles. But as the number of quasi-particles keeps increasing and let's say it becomes extensive, as is usually the case in a, a high energy eigenstate of a theory, then basically there are too many quasi-particles and they are all strongly interacting and all the quasi-particles have a very short and a finite lifetime. And then it's not a good picture to think about. However, in integrable systems, because uh, of certain, because of extensive number of conservation laws, actually what happens is that, uh, what happens is something remarkable. All the quasi-particles have, a, uh, all the eigenstates, all the high, even the high energy eigenstates have a quasi-particle distribution. Therefore, they automatically violate the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, okay? So this is one thing. And there are many well-known examples of this. For example, the, uh, in one dimension, for example, the transverse field Ising model. In two dimensions, for example, the uh, Kitaev model and so on. So, yeah. 
Then there is another class, which is sort of uh, more recently well understood, which is uh, many body localization. And this is most well understood in one dimensional lattice models, where you typically start with an interacting, let's say spin Hamiltonian again, and then maybe you introduce some disorder in the spin Hamiltonian in the form of, let's say, a random magnetic field. And then if you crank up the disorder, then you actually see that there is a transition from uh, your spectrum respecting ETH versus your spectrum not respecting ETH at all. Okay. So here, in fact, all the high energy eigenstates in the many body localized phase, all the high energy eigenstates, in fact, have uh, area law in time. Okay. So, whereas, uh, as I said in response to one of the questions, in the uh, I, in the in in a generic system, if the eigenstates satisfy ETH, most of the uh, high energy eigenstates satisfy volume law. Okay, so so in both these situations, in both these situations, uh, 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 basically this happens because there is an extensive number. So when I say extensive number, it means that. Uh, a number scaling with the uh, number of degrees of freedom in the system. That's why I call it extensive. Okay, so in both these cases, there's an extensive number of emergent conservation laws. Okay, and because of these extensive number of emergent conservation laws, almost all the initial conditions retain a lot of memory, even under unitary dynamics uh, with an interacting. Because that interacting theory has this uh, built-in hidden structure in it. That there are so many conservation laws. Okay, that's why that theory cannot sort of thermalize. Okay, so both these things have one thing in common. Of course, the mechanisms are completely different, but one common feature is that both these uh, sort of mechanisms uh, happen because there's an extensive number of emergent conservation laws in the theory. Okay, and because of these emergent conservation laws, almost all initial conditions fail to sort of thermalize. Okay, so yeah, so if you would have looked at a graph like this here, even though you would have started with two uh, sort of uh, initial conditions which basically have the same energy density, uh, nonetheless, if you had quenched it uh, through an integrable model or through a many body localized Hamiltonian, then the final answers would have gone to some completely different uh, places there, they would not have gone to the thermal. Answer. Even though both the theories are interacting. Okay. okay, so, however, for this talk, for whatever rest of the time I have, uh, uh, so till people get exhausted, um, I'll talk of a different mechanism, which I have schematically indicated here. So, this left hand picture is a schematic picture, whereas the right hand picture is an actual lattice calculus. There's an actual lattice calculation on an actual uh, physical field, okay, a numerical calculation. So, what is the schematic picture that I want to convey? So, again, I start with some generic interacting quantum model, some interacting quantum model. So, uh, this is supposed to sort of convey to you increasing energy. So, if I look at mid spectrum states here, if I look at mid spectrum states here, these mid spectrum states satisfy ETH, right? These satisfy ETH. However, because of some peculiarities, uh, there are a certain number of energy eigenstates here, which I indicate by these lines here and which I call anomalous high energy states. And these eigenstates, which are Im embedded, these eigenstates are embedded in, a, in an otherwise ETH respecting uh, spectrum. These eigenstates actually strongly violated. These eigenstates actually strongly violated. Okay, they look nothing like a neighboring eigenstate here. So, see what does ETH say? ETH say, says that if I take an eigenstate here and if I take a neighboring eigenstate here, because uh, this vertical line just indicates energy, then of course, neighboring eigenstates have basically the same local properties, right? Because they have basically the same energy density. But here I'm saying that if I take an eigenstate here and I take a neighboring eigenstate, which is maybe this magenta line, then this eigenstate, which is in this green bulk and this magenta eigenstate, they have completely different local properties. Whereas the eigenstate in the green bulk, you thermal, looks thermal, this magenta thing looks completely atheral. 
Okay, so that's what I've written here. And now imagine the following situation. If you start with an initial condition in your lab, which has a rather strong overlap with some of these eigenstates, then, then just by this uh, equation, <coughs> those kinds of initial conditions would not thermalize. Those kinds of initial conditions would not thermalize. Even though there are some highly simple, uh, simply preparable initial conditions in a lab, uh, lab thing. In a, in a in a lab frame okay so 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 that's basically our idea here so here i have shown exactly that in an actual calculation which i'll give the details of later in my talk so you see here i have started with three initial conditions in some complicated system in some complicated interacting system so these three initial conditions red green and blue they all have the same energy density by construction however why the blue curve and the green curve basically go to the same answer under unitary evolution and that answer is basically related to the thermal answer this red curve does not at all go to the thermal answer it goes some uh, somewhere completely different. okay so that shows you what i mean by weak ergodicity breaking so weak ergodicity breaking means that in an interacting theory while most simple initial conditions uh, thermalize there are some simple initial conditions which completely fail to thermalize. And the reason for that is that even though this is an interacting theory, in your many body spectrum, there are some uh, highly anomalous states which are embedded in your uh, many body spectrum. Now, the number of these anomalous uh, eigenstates may be order one. Okay. Then, so let's say I'm just considering a one dimensional system for computers with capital L spins. So the number of uh, these anomalous states may be order one, the number of these anomalous states may be order L, or the number may be order exponential of L. There are now examples where we can show all these three different scenarios. But the important point is that uh, whatever that scenario is, there are always simple initial states which have a strong overlap with a few of these states such that their feature shows up in the unitary dynamics of such initial states. Okay, so this is what I mean by weak ergodicity breaking. And I hope I have at least convinced you why this is completely different from this. See, in this scenario, almost all initial conditions retain the, their memory of initial state during the dynamics. Okay, but here, only some of the initial conditions which have a strong overlap with these magenta states, they retain a, their, a memory of their initial conditions, whereas the other initial conditions, they basically thermalize. Okay, so that's why I differentiate these mechanisms and call them under a global name of weaker goddess. Okay, I hope this point is clear. Okay, what I mean by this in general. Okay, so, so okay, if this is clear, then uh, let me go on. So I said, as I said uh, in the introduction to my talk, this field was basically revived. Uh, this uh, this whole thing about weak ergodicity breaking, this was revived by uh, a beautiful experiment in uh, um, the Harvard lab uh, by Lucan and his collaborators in 2017. So what was this experiment? So they again took uh, some uh, quantum simulator Okay, some of, one of these experimental platforms which I talked about where these unitary dynamics and where the system is very well isolated from the rest of the environment, okay, where this can actually be done in a tabletop experiment or something like that. So without going into the nitty gritties of the experiment, what we just need to remember is that their experiment had a rather impressive 51 qubits. Okay? which tells you that this is a rather large Hilbert space uh, already. Okay? So that's point one. And they could do their experiment here. So all that we need to understand or glean out from their experiment without going into too many details is that their experiments were done on Rydberg atoms. And uh, for these Rydberg atoms, you can think of them for, sim for, uh, for simplicity as a two state object at each side. Okay. So uh, one state is when the Rydberg atom is in its ground state and the other state is when the Rydberg atom is in its highly excited state. Okay, So these are sort of the two states of the 
did do that. So if you wish, uh, for a 51 qubit system, the Hilbert space is two raised to the power 51. Okay, we'll soon see that the number is actually smaller than that because of something very important. Okay, but nonetheless, without going into too many details now, this is some highly interacting system of 51 Wittberg atoms with a very large Hilbert space. Uh, okay, then what they did in the experiment is they took certain initial conditions and these initial conditions basically have the same energy density. So what would you expect? You would expect you prepare those initial conditions in your lab and you just let them go. You, let, you just quench them with respect to this uh, interacting Hamiltonian. What you would expect is precisely this, precisely this. But what they saw in their experiment was something completely different and extremely surprising. What they saw was while most initial conditions rapidly thermalized, while most initial conditions rapidly thermalized, there were few initial conditions, very simply preparable initial conditions, which actually failed to thermalize. In fact, they showed some very peculiar oscillations. So here I've just uh, indicated that in an actual calculation, let's just focus on two initial conditions. Both of them have the same energy density. In fact, their energy density is chosen such that they have infinite temperature if you do the effective statistical mechanics calculation. So they have a very high energy density. So with respect to this picture, we, we are sort of choosing the initial conditions to be mid-spectrum, okay? So, yeah. So, so, so one of the initial conditions is the Rydberg vacuum. So each of these 51 qubits is in its Rydberg vacuum state, okay? Right, is in its ground state. Another initial condition is another very simple one where let's say atom one is in its highly excited state, which I indicate by one here. Atom two is in its uh, ground state. Atom three is in its highly excited state. Atom four in, is in its ground state. So it's just an alternating pattern of one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. Of course, its symmetry partner is zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, and so on. So if you start with zero, 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 what you see is that the system quickly thermalizes. This is actually a numerical calculation based on exact diagonalization on a model, which is known as this PXP model, which I'll soon introduce to you, okay? Uh, whereas, uh, whereas uh, so you can see that this thing basically goes to the thermal answer indicated by this blue line, blue dashed line here. And very soon it goes to the thermal answer. Whereas uh, if you start with uh, something else, if you start with something else, uh, which is this uh, 101010 state, uh, then basically the system, the many body wave function goes to sort of its partner 010101, and then again goes to 101010 and keeps on doing this back and forth, back and forth. But you see, this is something which we know happens for, let's say a single spin undergoing something like a block oscillation. I mean, this never happens. This kind of a persistent oscillation never happens in a many body spectrum in the middle of the spectrum because there's an exponentially large number of states uh, near the single starting state, right? So this kind of a thing is highly, highly unusual in a many body uh, uh, setting, okay? And then the immediate question is why on earth did this happen? So I hope, even if you don't know the nitty gritty of this, I hope this you find surprising that this could at all happen in, ex in an experiment and this many people found surprising. And then they started sort of uh, thinking about how this can happen in a actual many body quantum system, which is interacting, right? And then this led to all these development, which are called many body quantum stars, okay? So yeah, but I yeah. Question. So mm -hmm why this amplitude of the oscillation decays? Okay, very good question. So I'll actually highlight that uh, later on in my talk. So, uh, so, 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 so maybe Shantan, hold on to this question. If it's not clear in the next few slides, you no, can no, ask this to me no, again. No, no, no. Uh, so basically just a short answer. There is a distinction between exact quantum many body stars and approximate quantum many body stars. While exact quantum many body stars require fine tuning of the Hamiltonian, okay, approximate quantum many body stars may be far more general in nature, which is kind of exciting. Okay, so the experiment actually realized what is called approximate quantum many body stars. Okay, okay. but of course, so you see what where I'm going already by the nomenclature I chose, but I'll try to explain it in more detail. Okay.
okay so so this whole uh, terminology of quantum stars is very well known in uh, in sort of uh, uh, one body physics okay so uh, so i think i'm yeah already closing the hour mark so maybe i'll take sort of half an hour more or maybe 20 minutes more and then we can stop mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. you have written this, so it's a kind of a billiard type of system. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, yeah. So this one body example was very well known in uh, classical physics. So, so, so here I'm just showing a picture where there are several classical trajectories. Okay, and there are of course elastic collisions, and uh, you see, I mean, uh, different trajectories are just shown in the same color. Okay. So in problem one. You see, your phase space is two-dimensional, but in problem one, you have two obvious conservation laws. First is energy, and the second is because this is circular, there's a uh, angular momentum conservation as well. So this problem is integrable. So of course, it's not surprising that the trajectories are not chaotic, right? It's not surprising at all. Now look at the second problem. The second problem is a more complicated billiard uh, shape, right? In the second problem, again, I've shown multiple trajectories, again, indicated by the same color. If you started with many, many of them, you would have basically densely populated the interior of the stadium, which basically tells you that there is chaos in the problem. Why is there chaos? Because now there is only one conservation law in the problem, the energy. Because of the more complicated boundary condition, the other conservation law is lost. Okay, and that's why this problem is chaotic. Okay? So Classically, uh, you actually want uh, like uh, want to study the Lyapunov stability. From that, you want to comment on the. Chaotic. No, I don't want to really comment on that. It's obvious that problem one is not chaotic, whereas problem two is chaotic. I mean, yeah, of course, then you can characterize it using Lyapunov expo exponents and stuff like that. Yeah, that's correct. So in the problem one, the Lyapunov exponent is zero. In problem two, it's non-zero. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But even on general grounds, it's clear that problem one is not chaotic and problem two is chaotic. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's the important. Of course, there are different ways of characterizing chaos, as we know. There are multiple ways of characterizing chaos. I mean, that's a field in itself. But right? is there so, any uh, quantum version available of chaos? Exactly, exactly. So that's again very well known. The one body quantum version is very well known. It's well known from the work of uh, pioneering work of Heller in 1984. So basically what you can imagine is, you just take this problem, just take this problem. What is this problem? A free particle. So it's like you just solve the minus H cut square by 2M grad square psi equal to E psi, right? You just solve that problem, but with a very complicated boundary condition. I mean, we know how to solve this problem for like a square, uh, you know, like an infinite barrier thing and all that stuff. But of course, if I give you a boundary condition like this, then you cannot analytically solve it. But you can solve it on the computer. If you solve it on the computer and you just uh, enumerate uh, the nature of the energy eigenfunctions, okay, that you can do, then you would see that there are some very peculiar eigenfunctions. So most of the eigenfunctions, if you just draw the probability density in space of those eigenfunctions, then you would see that most of the eigenfunctions are basically sort of diffused in space. That's the quantum version of this classical chaos, if you wish. However, there are some very particular eigenfunctions. So it's like on your computer, you just arrange the eigenfunctions in terms of their increasing energy. Most of the time, the eigenfunctions, uh, they'll be highly delocalized in space. But once in a while, once in a while, you land up with some very particular eigenfunction, which if you plot its uh, psi of x in space, mod of psi of x in space, then you would see that uh, it's highly, highly localized, right? And you can sort of see these uh, sort of trajectories here. I mean, of course, there's a quantum problem, but you can sort of make out these trajectories here, right? And these trajectories would have survived as unstable, uh, sort of uh, non-chaotic trajectories in the classical. So this is sort of the quantum version. Of this. And uh, this is well known as a, a one body quantum uh, scar in uh, the literature. And people have also seen these uh, experimentally doing, doing beautiful uh, experiments using sort of uh, microwave radiation and cavities where they can mimic these boundary conditions. And then what they could see is that while for 
um, while for most of the time the cavity basically was just filled with radiation there were some very peculiar states where these kinds of profiles emerged so people have done fantastic experiments on these kinds of things as well so this thing has be has a long history okay one body quantum series okay this has a very long history now what i'm going to tell you is the many body version of it which has a very short history okay and uh, there are several open questions which people are still thinking about okay so yeah. so maybe i'll just introduce this pxp model and uh, tell you about the funny things about that and then maybe i'll just uh, stop okay so because this pxp model is sort of if you wish uh, now becoming like the ising model of this field right so this is one of those sort of minimal models which uh, uh, taught people a lot and uh, another nice thing about this model is that uh, this model mimics this rydberg atom experiment uh, rather well yeah so if you wish uh, the rydberg atom thing uh, already sort of uh, uh, gives you the dynamics of this model to a good approximation Okay, so here I have some sort of uh, slides which are handwritten because I want to convey to you a minimal. I want to convey to you in the easiest possible manner a minimal s equal to half model which captures this uh, Rydberg atom experiment, and then I'll show you that this uh, model has these quantum stars. Okay, so that's basically the idea in the remaining time. So if you remember, Shantan, I said that uh, this. Uh, Uh, if you just glean out the basic components, see any condensed matter system is obviously very complicated. Any condensed matter system. So when one thinks of a minimal model, one just tries to keep the minimal ingredients from the physics and hopes that captures the uh, dynamics of the problem to a reasonable approximation. Right? That is true for any many-body system in condensed matter. Right? So so here, what are the minimal components which are important for us? So the first minimal component is that. as i said the rydberg atom i can just think of it as a two state object either is it it's in its rydberg ground state or is it or it's in it in its rydberg highly excited state okay so therefore i can just think of it as an effective spin half degree of freedom so i want to write a hamiltonian in terms of quantum spin half degrees of freedom right because the spin half is like a two state problem in quantum mechanics so that's the natural language i should think about so here i have written this So sigma i z equal to plus one denotes a Rydberg excitation, whereas sigma i z equal to minus one denotes a Rydberg ground state, and the i denotes the uh, sort of a site index, right? Because in the experiment there were sort of these fifty-one sites on on a line, so this i is like the site index, okay? And because I'm a theorist, it helps me to think of periodic boundary condition. So instead of a line, you can just think of the problem on a ring. Okay, on a ring. So that's the periodic boundary condition. So now, uh, what is the thing which gives you a minimal quantum dynamics? The thing which gives you the minimal quantum dynamics is like a sigma i x operator. So these are just Pauli uh, matrices, uh, which are well known. So sigma i x just uh, if it acts on a, a plus one state, gives you minus one. If it acts on a minus one, it gives you plus one, vice versa. so as i have written here it converts a rydberg excitation to its ground state and vice versa now here comes a very important component of the experiment which will be important in the theory as well it is well known in the community of rydberg atoms in the community of people doing these cold atom experiments with rydberg atoms that one can induce something called the so called strong rydberg blockade so what is a strong rydberg blockade it just says that uh, so i'm not explaining why it happens it just says that if you are on some site where the rydberg atom has already entered its excited state and if the next atom the atom next to it also tries to enter a high energy rydberg excitation then you pay a huge energy cost you pay a huge energy cost okay so that 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 is what is called strong rydberg blockade so you pay a huge energy cost if two of the neighboring sites if two of the neighboring sites are simultaneously plus one you pay a huge energy cost so i want to just project out that part of my hilbert space so what i say is that there is a hard constraint in my hilbert space that 
no two neighboring spins can be simultaneously plus one. Okay, that's a hard constraint on my Hilbert space. No two neighboring spins can be simultaneously plus one. So this is exactly what I've indicated by this picture. Let me not care about what the physical state of these other processes is. Just imagine that these two spins are plus one simultaneously. Then I just disallow that state. But suppose this spin is uh, uh, minus one and this spin is plus one, then that's allowed. Similarly, if this spin is uh, plus one and this spin is minus one, that's allowed. Similarly, if both spins are minus one, that's also allowed. So this is what is called as a constrained Hilbert space. Okay, because there's this hard constraint in your definition of uh, what the allowed states are in your Hilbert space. Okay. And this is simply done to mimic this thing in the experiment, to mimic this idea of strong window block. So there is some energy cost in your system, a very high energy cost. You just push that scale to infinity. Okay, that's what I have done. Okay, I hope this point is clear. Okay, right. So now this is a fun uh, counting problem, which I will encourage uh, people to just think about if it's not immediately obvious. It's a fun counting problem. I have already indicated how to solve this counting problem. So now you start with a ring with capital L spins. Suppose you didn't have this constraint and I asked you how many states are allowed in the Hilbert space. The answer is very simple. Two raised to the power L because the local Hilbert space dimension is two. So you just exponentiate that and you get two raised to the power L. But now there is this constraint, right? Now there is this constraint that uh, no two neighboring spins can be simultaneously plus one plus one. So obviously the number of allowed states in your Hilbert space is much smaller than two raised to the power n. That's intuitively obvious. Uh, so now if I ask you, can you give me the exact count of this? So then, so I, I have sort of indicated how to get this. Uh, you can actually do this counting by a simple transform matrix approach. And uh, basically you can just write the exact answer for a ring with capital L sides. The exact answer is, that the number of such uh, states in your Hilbert space, the number of allowed states in your Hilbert space for a system with capital L spins satisfying periodic boundary conditions, that number goes as the sum of two Fibonacci numbers where this is FL minus one and this is FL plus one. And this is how Fibonacci numbers are defined. This is the usual rule in which Fibonacci numbers are defined. Okay, I mean, that's the definition of Fibonacci numbers. Now, if you ask me, uh, what happens when you go to the large L limit, then in the large L limit, the number of the states is not two raised to the power L. In fact, it's phi raised to the power L, where this number phi is smaller than two, and it's this well-known irrational number called the golden uh, ratio, 1.61 something, something. Okay, so you can just uh, sort of do this transform matrix calculation and think about how this comes up. Okay, it's a fun thing to do if you haven't seen this before. So I hope this point is clear that this Hilbert space is constrained. And because this Hilbert space is constrained, not all states are allowed. And because not all states are allowed, uh, the number of allowed states is not two raised to the power L. In fact, it's a number which again, of course, grows exponentially with system size. But uh, this uh, number is more non-trivial. It's actually this, okay, this uh, golden ratio. I mean, hope, hopefully this point is clear. Otherwise, um, I can pause. Yeah. Hello? No, I'm saying that sure. I have understood. Okay, good. Okay, so now comes the second ingredient. Now I have this constraint Hilbert space. So if you wish, this is my universe now. Okay? And I don't care what's living outside this universe. There are, of course, some high energy processes outside this universe. I don't care about that. Now I want to write the most local dynamics in this universe. So what is the meaning of most local dynamics? I want to just write some Hamiltonian, which gives you some quantum dynamics. And that Hamiltonian should be a sum of the most local possible terms that you can write. Down. I mean, so there's a very strict sense in which locality is going to be imposed here. So one obvious thing that you might think about is, okay, let me just write down this Hamiltonian. Okay, because after all, as I said, sigma ix just flips an upspin to down and flips a downspin to up. But you will immediately see that this kind of an operator, this kind of an operator does not keep you in your uh, Hilbert space, in your constraint Hilbert space. It's very simple to see that. So, sorry, sometimes I use zero for minus one because zero is the language adopted by the 
Rydberg Atom guys and one is, but this is just a two state problem. So hopefully this is not very confusing. Sorry about this. Uh, uh, so you see, suppose I just start with an initial state like that. I mean, I have not indicated what are the spins here. That's not so important, but just look at this spin. Suppose I want to flip this spin. If I flip this spin to one, you immediately see that I go out of my constraint Hilbert space because then you see that these two spins are together plus one. These two spins are also together plus one. They violate your hard constraint. Okay, so this is not an allowed dynamics. So then my question is, what is the most local allowed dynamics? That's the question. So it turns out that the most local allowed dynamics is this so-called PXP model. So just to motivate that model, again, please look at this picture, which I've drawn here. Now, again, let's look locally, because after all, if I want to think of the local dynamics, it's enough to just look at a patch in my system, right? And then I can just add up the dynamics like this. So, so now, now you can see that I can flip the spin independently of its neighbors, if both the neighbors are sort of zero uh, in the Rydberg atom language, okay? Why? Because suppose this is zero, then there is no problem at all. But suppose I flip this guy to one, then there is again no problem locally, right? Because this guy is zero, this is one, that's allowed. This guy is one, this is zero, that's also allowed. So there is no problem with the this dynamics. So how do I impose this dynamics on the lattice? Very simple. I So suppose this side I call I. So this flipping is done by the sigma IX operator. But now I also want this size, uh, this side to be zero and this side to be zero when this uh, sigma x acts here. So I just have a projector on the left side, i minus one, and on the right side, i, my, I plus one. And this projector is just a downspin projector. And it's very simple to write this in terms of Pauli matrices like this. So all that this projector does is if you add this projector on a side j, let's call this side j. If this projector sees a downspin, it just passes through, okay? And if it sees an upspin, it's just annealed. That's the property of this projector. So this is your many body Hamiltonian, this guy, that's it. And that's why it's called a PXP Hamiltonian. Why? Because this is projector, this is X, and this is projector. So that's why it's called PXP, that's it. Okay, that's why the people call it as the PXP Hamiltonian. So I hope it's clear that this is the most minimal local Hamiltonian that you can write with respects the constraints of the strong Rydberg block. Okay, so this is the most natural minimal Hamiltonian which you can write for uh, describing this uh, Rydberg atom experiment. Okay, in fact, this model has an interesting history. So you see such kinds of constraint models, so I won't have the time to go into this. This is a very general concept. Such kinds of constraint models usually appear in uh, strongly correlated condensed matter systems uh, in when you consider effective theories for the low energy spectrum of uh, such theories. In fact, uh, a generalized version of this model exactly appeared in this very old work by Sashtev, Sengupta, and Gervin, uh, in which uh, they were actually considering a problem of a mott insulator in strong electric field in a, sorry in strong electric field in a uh, in one dimension for a problem of bosons so they tried to sort of write a simplified version of the full hamiltonian by going into the subspace of the low energy states and in that subspace they basically got a generalized version of this thing okay of course uh, uh, Sajdev, Sengupta, and Gervin, they were just interested in the low energy properties and the quantum phase transitions of this model, because at that time, people were not thinking about quantum scars or the or ETH or thermalization of the spectrum, right? Uh, so they did not land up with these things. But all I wanted to tell you was that this model uh, this is not the first time it appeared. In fact, this model has a rather nice history. It's already sort of known in the literature and it made a reappearance when people started thinking about these uh, many body quantum stars. Okay, so it just made a reappearance and these new concepts emerged when people looked at this old model, but through a fresh perspective. Okay, so yeah. So, so, so now, uh, so here I've just written the uh, here I've just written the 
uh, many body Hamiltonian again, and I have described in pictures what this Hamiltonian does. So if you sort of go through your lattice and you find that there is some spin whose neighbors are both down spins, then you can freely flip that spin like this. This is your quantum lattice. This is your local quantum lattice. Okay. And uh, 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 right. And then uh, looking at level statistics and some other properties, which I won't have the time to go into, people could uh, sort of figure out that this problem is not integrable. It's in fact highly non-integrable because the level statistics does not mimic a Poisson distribution. It in fact it mimics something called a Wigner Dyson distribution. Sorry, I'm not explaining these terms, but I'm almost sure that maybe in some of the previous talks in uh, Shyanthan's forum, these concepts may have been discussed because these are such general concepts and they emerge just from random matrix theory and uh, yeah, yeah, there are consequences of that, okay, right. So, so, so basically looking at uh, the, uh, the data on the spectra of these models for finite sizes, people know that these, uh, this kind of a model is a non integral Okay. So it's basically exactly like uh, this thing here. But now, how do I know that some of the states in this model are anomalous? That's the real question. How do I know that, right? I know that again uh, from my numerics, Suppose, now please concentrate on this curve and please for a moment, forget about the green line. Please just concentrate on the blue line, okay? So here, my initial wave function is this one zero, one zero, one zero initial state that I start. So let's say I take the state on my computer. This is my initial state. This is called a Z2 state. Uh, this is called a Z2 state because uh, there is a one zero, one zero, one zero and there's its partner zero, one zero, one zero, one. And then if you again impose the symmetry, it comes back to one zero, one zero, one zero. So basically there's a Z2 symmetry there. So you just call it a Z2 state. That's the terminology adopted in the field now for, to denote the state. So there is a Z2 and there's a Z2 prime, if you wish, for its partner, right? Okay, so suppose you start with the Z2 state. Now you look at this very interesting quantity, the many body return problem, the many body fidelity or the many body return problem. So you see, what am I doing here? I'm looking at this thing numerically. And again, please concentrate on the blue line. So here the green and the blue line coincide. So this, uh, this graph would hopefully answer Shainton's question about approximate versus uh, uh, exact scars. And I'll come to that uh, also in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. And then I'll sort of wrap up. Okay, so you see, suppose you start with the Z2 state and you do a unitary evolution, right? This is your unitary evolution where this H is this PXP Hamilton. Okay, so you do it, let's say on your computer, because there's a highly interacting theory, you don't know how to do it analytically. So let's say you do it on your computer. Then you see what I'm doing here. I'm just taking the overlap with Z2 again. So that's basically the return probability of this many body wave function. So if you had taken a generic uh, non-integrable system, and uh, suppose you take this, this particular system itself, and if you had taken not the Z2 state, but some other, initial state, then typically what would have happened is that this fidelity would have exponentially gone to zero as a function of time and then just stayed zero for a big system. Okay, right? It would have just stayed zero. But here something miraculous happens. It goes to zero, stays zero. So you think, aha, this is just behaving like I expect. But then after a certain time scale, there is a many body revival of the entire wave function and it revives, please follow my cursor, right? And then it again goes down and it again revives, it again goes down, it again revives. So there are these, if you wish, there are these periodic revivals because see this number is close to 0.5, uh, sorry, close to five. This number is close to 10. This number is close to 15, close to 20. So there are periodic revivals. So if I ask you, for example, what is the time scale in terms of this W? This W is just giving me a pre-factor. What is the time scale of this revival? That's actually a highly non-trivial question. You cannot guess it just by looking at the Hamilton. And secondly, you could have never guessed these revivals just by looking at this Hamilton. Now, of course, these revivals are decaying. What that means is, if I look at this system for a very long time scale, then ultimately these revivals, so please follow the cursor again, there's an envelope, and these revivals basically decay to zero. 
but in terms of the natural units of the system. So this T, I have normalized with respect to W. So this T is in the natural units of the system. In terms of the natural units of this system, you would still see these uh, features of these quantum stars for a very long time so before they'll decay. And that is also related to what you saw in this numerical, these details, right? That's related to that. But now, if you just add some small perturbations, if you add some small perturbations to these PXP terms, some small perturbations, and these are these green curves, if you add some small perturbations, then you can actually show that you can make these revivals almost perfect. Almost perfect. And then even if you go till very long time scales, you'll just keep seeing these many body revivals. Okay. And uh, so in the PSP model, I would call the stars as approximate stars. In this slightly tweaked perturbed PSP model, I would call them to be sort of exact quantum stars, right? And uh, so, yeah, so now you can ask, uh, of course, there's a, a very complicated problem, but is there some sense in which I can think physically about this, right? Uh, okay, so this is the story so far. I <laughs> hope this is clear so far. One question, maybe. Yes, uh, yes. This periodic revival mm -hmm. is some kind of, some sort of related with this Wigner Dyson type of ensemble? No, 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 it's not, it's not. So, so Wigner Dyson ensemble basically characterizes systems in this problem with satisfy ETH. Okay. So if you had systems with satisfy ETH, then you would have seen that this green curve just goes to zero like this, and then it just stays zero. Okay. okay. So however, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this fidelity just exponentially goes to zero and then it just stays. Zero. Okay. That's the generic behavior. Okay. But because in your spectrum, because in your spectrum, there are these anomalous states and because this Z2 state, this Z2 state with the experimentalists also start with, this Z2 state has a huge overlap with those anomalous states. Therefore, it does something highly non highly peculiar because those anomalous states don't satisfy it. Then your fidelity does not just crash to zero. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Yeah, so that's a very, very surprising thing. Okay, so... Good. Okay, so let me go on. Uh, let me go on. So, uh, yeah. So, as I said, uh, if you look at the high energy spectra, you should be able to see that there are these anomalous high energy states. Okay, so this is exactly what you see in the numerics. Please concentrate on the left graph. Uh, these are taken from these theory papers, which subsequently followed the experimental uh, thing by Lukin's lab in 2017. So basically, within one year, people sort of came up with the rationalization that the PXP model explains some of the very non-trivial things observed in the experiment on the Rydberg atoms. Okay, and then now we know many sort of examples which go beyond uh, this PXP model. Okay, we know now many examples, and there are lots of things to be learned. Okay, so 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 let's just focus here. So you see, I have uh, done some. I have plotted some numerical data here. And I've plotted this curve here. So you see, uh, these data has been plotted using this uh, color density map. So these warmer colors are supposed to indicate uh, higher energy density, uh, sorry, higher density of states. So when the density of states is high, then basically they fall on top of the canonical curve, as you can see from my cursor, which basically tells you that uh, if you're in the high energy spectrum of your, uh, if you're in the high energy part of your spectrum, where your density of states is the maximum, then basically you satisfy ETH, which is exactly what this is. But now look at the energy values here. Now you see, I have indicated some crosses here, which are again, actual numerical data. Now these crosses, which are basically at these energy densities, they, are com they have some completely different values of this local correlation function. This local correlation function is, by the way, you just go into this system and just look at sigma iz for any site. That's it. That's the local correlation. You take any eigenstate, calculate sigma iz expectation on some site, and you just look at it for all the eigenstates. That's this uh, y-axis here. Okay. So you see, even though there are neighboring energy eigenstates here, which have basically the same energy as these guys, but they have completely different values for this local expectation. So clearly these states are anomalous. They are strongly violating uh, ETH. 
okay now they are very very different from the values of this line okay and now why is this z2 state important to catch them in the dynamics this z2 state is important because you see this z2 state is the one which has the largest overlap which has the largest overlap with uh, these anomalous uh, band of states now let's think very physically because uh, i don't want to take too much of your time now uh, let's think very physically these anomalous states uh, sort of seem to be equally spaced in energy there is another numerical observation which i can tell you about if you look at a certain system size and if you look at a bigger system size you see that the number of these anomalous states sort of scales as l plus 1 it sort of scales linearly in the number of spins in the system okay so now think of the simplest quantum mechanics problem that you know where there are l plus 1 levels and the levels are equally spaced let's think of the simplest quantum mechanical problem that you know that problem is a an su2 spin whose spin quantum number is capital l by 2 and let's say that spin is in a magnetic field right so that spin that su2 spin whose spin quantum number is capital l by 2 obviously has 2 times l by 2 plus 1 so that is l plus 1 number of states and if you put that giant spin in a magnetic field then of course the energy levels are split and all the l plus 1 energy levels are spaced equally with respect to each other right obviously of course another quantum mechanics problem which you know of which has equal energy levels is the problem of the harmonic oscillator but unfortunately the harmonic oscillator has an infinite number of such levels if i want to think of some problem which has sort of order l such levels this is the simplest quantum mechanics problem i can now you would say oh i'm talking of a highly highly interacting quantum theory how on earth can it be that in some sense i'm looking at the hilbert space or the energy eigen states of this theory and somehow there is some hidden corner in in this uh, interacting theory which mimics a giant su2 spin because that's after all what's happening i hope physically it's clear what i'm trying to say even though i haven't told you what the mechanism is right i mean this is the simplest quantum mechanical problem that sort of gives you this kind of a structure if you just concentrate on these l plus 1 and i'm just okay so 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 what so i won't go through this slide this is just to i just want to comment uh, like ask you one more thing in the previous slide yeah yes this one yeah so yeah. when we were talking about z1 so why this values are appearing negative oh why these values are appearing negative abhi in uh, you see this problem does not have an up down spin symmetry you see this problem does not have an up down spin symmetry so i mean so zero is not so important yes i mean yeah so therefore uh, i mean then it's a finer But detail why it's relative sign it's, uh, no it's more uh, more often negative because uh, i mean if you look at this picture again for example just look at this picture two of the spins are negative one of the spin is positive two of the three of the spins are negative so if you just think of the local processes allowed by this hamiltonian i mean more processes uh, make oh. the you see you see i hope i have conveyed uh, the answer to you i mean if you just look at the expectation value there's higher probability that things are negative than things are positive right just by looking at this picture yeah okay yeah but that's a good point it's simply because the spin model breaks uh, this up down sort of symmetry just staring at the sun okay. yeah okay good so now uh, you can e even add a small perturbation to this hamiltonian uh, so this h not is the original pxp hamiltonian and then you can actually make these revivals perfect but i won't go into that right so yeah so okay so so here i'll just give you the sort of uh, two slide general picture this is a highly idealized picture this is not what is happening in the psp model but this is close to what is happening in the psp okay this picture that i'm giving you is a highly idealized picture but i want to at least end my talk with some sort of a picture which you can keep in your mind right so okay so here is the picture so basically 
imagine that you start with a problem okay which may be a very simple problem and that problem has some global symmetry and that global symmetry just uh, splits up your hilbert space into these blocks which are symmetry unruled okay so this block has some quantum global quantum numbers this block has some different global quantum numbers this block has some different quant global quantum numbers and so on and of course these blocks vary in size in particular if you want let's think of a very concrete problem let's say there are a bunch of free spins free spin halves and let's say the hamiltonian is summation of i si x that's it it's just a completely free theory but now there is an obvious conservation law uh, sx total being conserved so i can just uh, easily see that the largest block would be when sx total is close to 0 and the smallest block would be when sx total is proportional to l okay so there will be a variety of sizes just from symmetry how the symmetry sort of uh, breaks up your hilbert space okay. good now i add a perturbation to my theory so that i lift the symmetry okay i just add a perturbation so that i lift the symmetry uh, but this perturbation is a highly non generic perturbation so what do i mean by that highly non generic so what i mean by that is there is some particular corner in my hilbert space which is let's say annihilated exactly by this non generic perturbation remember this non generic perturbation actually lifts the symmetry but this non generic perturbation also annihilates this particular symmetry corner of your hilbert space then what is going to happen is when you consider the full theory h not plus this non generic perturbation then of course this perturbation mixes uh, up all the states here right this is what i have shown here mixes the rest and it in fact restores eth here because this non generic perturbation is typically an interacting theory but you see this non generic perturbation does not touch this corner of the hilbert space why because this non generic perturbation sort of annihilates this uh, corner of the hilbert space and because it annihilates this corner of the hilbert space this corner stays untouched and this corner can happily violate eth so this is like a high energy corner of your hilbert space which is untouched by this non generic perturbation and it happily violates eth so if you look at the full theory even the most of your state satisfy eth uh this corner does not satisfy eth this is the generic picture uh, in fact there is something in high energy which i don't know too much about but uh, it's uh, basically i think goes by the name of spectrum generating algebra and uh, something similar happens there okay but uh, let me give you a lattice example where i will realize this thing exactly for you i'll realize this mechanism exactly for you so i'll tell you a toy model where i'll realize this exactly for you and then basically i'll stop and maybe take some further questions from shanti or indians so right so here is the exact toy problem which will uh, do this so now again you start with a problem on a ring so again you have capital l number of spins on a ring okay and each of the spins is a spin half problem. but now i don't put a constraint on my hilbert space okay i'm considering a different problem i'm not considering the pxp problem i'm trying to make a toy problem where i would show that this thing is happening exactly that's my motivation so i consider capital l number of spin half degrees of freedom on a ring and of course because there are no constraints the number of states in your hilbert space is 2 raised to the power n now i want to find a sorry i want to find a subspace like this which i denote by curly v so curly v is a common null space of l projectors and the projectors are singlet projectors like this so what is a singlet projector you see i am considering spin half degrees of freedom if i consider two neighboring spin half degrees of freedom obviously these two neighboring spin half degrees of freedom one complete eigen basis of that is you go to the singlet or the triplet basis of these two spin half degrees of freedom right so either uh, these two spins can be thought of as a singlet or these two spins can be thought of as a triplet the spin is an s equal to zero object the triplet is a total s equal to one object right and that's completely general now you can easily write a projector from quantum mechanics uh, which basically uh, 
which basically kills the triplet state if you pass the projector, if you pass the state through the projector and sort of does not kill the singlet state. Okay, that's it. And uh, this I leave as an exercise. This projector is basically proportional to, uh, this projector is basically proportional to one minus sigma i dot sigma i plus one. Okay, where sigma i and sigma i plus one are the usual Pauli matrices. Okay, now, uh, now you can ask, what is the common null space of all these capital L projectors? That's an interesting question to ask. And again, from standard quantum mechanics, uh, the answer is very simple. The answer is the common null space is basically you just take capital L spins. Let's say you take four spins for simplicity, four spin halves. Then if you have four spin halves, obviously you can either have total spin S total equal to two, one, or zero. These are the only three possibilities. But if you want to form this null space, then you need to go to S total equal to two, which is the maximal spin quantum number you will get. Okay. So if you have capital L uh, sites, then the maximal spin quantum number from quantum mechanics is capital L by two. And the number of states is uh, L plus one. And you can show that uh, uh, these states, these L plus one states are the common null space of all these uh, projectors simultaneously. Then without going into too many details, you can actually write a, a Hamiltonian. So this is your toy model, as I was stating, like a bunch of non-interacting spins. But this model is a highly interacting model. But this um, second perturbation, even though it lifts all the symmetries of this problem, this second perturbation has this property uh, that uh, it completely annihilates this sector. You can just uh, verify that for yourself. It completely annihilates this particular sector. Because it completely annihilates this particular sector, if you start with certain initial conditions, if you start with certain, uh, okay, if you start with certain initial conditions, then those initial conditions are just like a giant spin feeling a magnetic field. And then it just does a usual spin precession, okay? And then you would get these oscillations, but now perfect oscillations, even in an infinite system. So this is a toy mechanism of what's actually happening in the PXP model. Uh, something similar happens in the PXP model, uh, but you see in this problem, in this problem, uh, this separation, between this subspace and this subspace is perfect. There are no matrix elements between this state and this state if you look at the Hamilton. There are no matrix elements here. But if you look at the PXP model, there are actually small matrix elements which are indicated by dots here. So if you didn't have these dots here, if you didn't have these dots, then I would have called the things which lived here as perfect quantum stars. But because you have these dots here, then in the PSP model, they are actually imperfect or approximate quantum scars. But because the strength of these dots or the strength of these matrix elements, which connect these quantum scars to the rest of the thermal ETH states is very small. Because the strength is very small. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, what you see is that there is this long time scale emerging here, okay? which I had also more clearly shown uh, in this graph, for example. Okay, because the strength of these uh, uh, things is very small. So yeah, maybe this is a good place for me to stop uh, because hopefully I have at least introduced to you what the PXP model is and why it's uh, very interesting to uh, uh, study. Uh, so yeah, maybe this is a good point for me to stop. Okay. Uh, I particularly don't have any questions right now because I have already asked so many things. And I can see that the people already feel right now uh, exhausted. That's why they left. And I also feel that you also feeling very exhausted after giving such a long uh, talk. Anyways, uh, so uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. And uh, uh, I hope once this is posted, people can contact you and learn something from this. Sure. The main motivation and uh, stay safe and healthy and thanks for agreeing to give 
this uh, nice talk and uh, the people before that uh, not touched this side that's why i have asked to give you this kind of talk so thank you for giving such an interesting uh, insight to towards this kind of problem and uh, yeah so thank you thank you okay and you also stay safe and uh, bye bye yeah yeah bye